So I finally watched The Whale. I'm going to get right to it. It was a huge letdown for me. I went into this movie expecting to cry and they wanted you to cry. They were pushing hard for that cry. I'm going in thinking it's going to be sad. It's going to be artistic. It's going to be deep. I'm 100% crying at this movie. It's so relevant to me in my life. I'm like, there's no way I'm not crying. I feel like that's part of why it took me so long to watch it because I'm like, the premise is Charlie, aka Brendan Fraser, is a 600 pound man who doesn't leave his house. And he wants to reconnect with his very angry, angsty teenage daughter because his health is deteriorating. This is gonna be a more chill video. Actually, specifically, it's a rant. <laughs> it turned into a whole rant about like the food industry and misguided fat activism as usual. And I know I'm way behind on this. This movie came out months ago, but I'm working on a bunch of like unfinished educational and like kind of like deep dive videos and they're not done yet. So, you get this rant on the whale instead. Also obligatory spoiler disclaimer. I don't know if this video technically has spoilers. I don't know what counts as a spoiler. I did not spoil the end, although I would love to because I hated the end, but yes, spoiler disclaimer. You get what you get if something is spoiled and you watch from this point on. Maybe it was just me expecting so much and like the hype, the controversy, and even the way this movie starts. It just has you expecting the absolute most from this movie. The whole movie opens to a chat screen showing that Charlie is an English teacher, an online English teacher, and everyone else has their camera on, but not Charlie. He tells his students that his camera is broken, but then it cuts to him and it's obviously a lie. And it's, you know, he doesn't want people to know that he's 600 pounds. And literally the first clip we see of Charlie, he's jerking it on the couch and has a heart attack while doing it. And that, that is a strong start. <laughs> Very unexpected all around. And it kind of creates this huge expectation, especially with all the hype, that I just don't know if the rest of the movie lived up to. While he's having this heart attack, he starts reading off this essay about Moby Dick, which he'll do throughout many times throughout the movie. Moby Dick, aka Herman Melville's classic novel about a fisherman who has a self-destructive obsession with killing this gigantic whale. My son has joined us. <laughs> The last bajillion times that I've tried to film, I've tried to get one of my dogs to sit on the chair and they've not been having it. So today I have everything set up in a way you can't even see the chair, just thinking like, yeah, nobody's gonna sit there, it doesn't matter. And now of course my dog is like peacefully, cutely sleeping there and you can't see him and I'd have to rearrange everything <laughs> for you to be able to see it. So that's my luck, I guess. I didn't know it at the time, but The Whale is actually an adaptation of Moby Dick, which is, which is pretty cool. In the title, The Whale is obviously in reference to Charlie, but also the book. Ahab is hell-bent on destroying Moby Dick. Brendan Fraser is hell-bent on destroying himself. He is Ahab and the whale simultaneously and I guess I think another layer could be so is his daughter. You're like ooh it's so deep like there's a double meaning so I, you know I do get why people thought this movie was really great but the movie has so many literal moments that are just so obvious and overly melodramatic that it just like doesn't feel deeper than that even if it is. Charlie even ends up saying he thinks his life will be better if he can just kill this whale but in reality it won't help him at all. This book made me think about my own life. Wow thank you for making that connection for me if it wasn't already deeply obvious. And I guess there's like this double meaning to it being that eventually we find out that it was his daughter is the one who, who's the one who really wrote it. But things that are just like that literal happen far too often for me. And I think that's the problem with the entire thing. It just felt so surface level when it could have been so much more. At one point his best friend who's also his nurse and sort of his enabler as well like she'll She'll occasionally bring him some food and that kind of thing. She says something to the effect of, oh, I believe that everyone has to save themselves or no one can be saved. Like they have to save themselves, something along those lines. But the rest of the movie is already kind of pointing you in the direction of why she might feel that way. Like you don't need to say the words so literally out loud. Like I, j I just hate when movies do that. I went into this movie expecting to cry. And I mean, for me, I did feel sad, but I was, I was supposed to be such an easy cry for this director. First off, I have a weird thing. <laughs> when overweight men are in danger in movies. <laughs> because throughout my life, my dad has always been overweight. And I guess this has like always been a major concern for me, even as a kid. Because as long as I can remember, anytime I've watched a movie where like a middle-aged overweight man is in danger, I've always felt this sort of like deep concern and sadness if anything happens to them in the movie. <laughs> The first one that comes to mind is when Newman dies in Jurassic Park. Like, even though he's like an asshole, his character sucks. It's like, <laughs> I remember feeling this like, this like gut punch of sadness when he dies. And I always get that feeling whenever like any middle aged overweight man is in danger in a movie. <laughs> also, my dad and my mom watch my videos. So, hey, mom and dad. And there is a fun fact for you guys that you should not know. 
anyway, whatever was going on on screen with the whale was like, don't get me wrong. It was sad, but like, it just wasn't, it wasn't hitting some like real realism button, I think. And it wasn't making me cry. It was sad in more of like a slow and a depressing way than like, a wow, I'm so deeply moved by this super realistic portrayal of a human experience type of a way. Like this is a man at the brink of his addiction. So I just feel like there is so much like material there to make it extremely thought provoking. The movie shows that Charlie's life is being destroyed by his addiction. And then seconds later, he's ordering food or like really, really like going in on whatever he's, he's already ordered. And this is a very sad reality of addiction. A lot of the time it's like ruining your life, but somehow simultaneously the best part of your life at the exact same time. It's the pain and the relief. And addiction is like a parasite and that it sort of takes over the host bit by bit until the host is the addiction. And for the film director, I feel like there is so much story to tell there. And yet there's just like some note or some level of it was just, it was just missing to get me like fully invested, I think. Starting with the fat suit. I feel like I'm probably a harsh critic because I'm probably a lot more familiar with people at that size than the average viewer of this movie. But like my eyes were just not being fooled by that fat suit. It's not like it was like some nutty professor abomination or that Kaylee Cuoco one, which is this like, on another level of bad. Probably like half the criticism and the controversy surrounding this movie comes down to the fat suit too. I think that the fat suit was done as tastefully as it could have been. Like I didn't find it offensive, but like I don't find, I really don't find anything overly offensive. I do think it's fair to be anti-fat suit no matter what, no matter how tastefully done it is, I do get the argument behind it. But at the same time, I heard a lot of people saying, oh, well, why not just get like a 600 pound person to play this role? Why not hire a 600 pound actor? But that is just like, it's just like not realistic at all. I feel like it kind of demonstrates how little people know about what it actually must be like to live life at 600 pounds. Like you're not really acting, like you're, you're one shade off of realistically being bed bound. And in most cases, the director is gonna pick the best actor for the role and then literally go out and ask that actor or actress to lose or gain weight to extreme degrees as we've seen in a lot of celebrity transformations. But in this case, you're not gonna ask any actor to go and gain that much weight. Like that is a dangerous amount of weight to ask someone to gain. Like you're literally putting that person's life at risk. And that is really the stark reality of the situation. I feel like when I say stuff like this, sometimes people think I'm like being rude or something, but I'm like, I feel like I'm just saying the most accurate word for the situation. Like that's how I try and speak. Um, in this case, there's no way to sugarcoat it. Like that is th the truth of the situation. And sometimes the truth, it's harsh, but that is reality here. And even if you could find a 600 pound actor, are they going to be a 600 pound actor as good as Brendan Fraser? And then you go back to the sort of fat suits argument in general, which means like if we banned all fat suits, then we can never make a movie like this at all because we'd always need to find a 600 pound actor and they always wouldn't be able to perform the full duties of the role. I think it's interesting to think culturally like where we are at right now like the fact that this movie is coming out right now at this moment in time I really think that this story this type of story is an important one that just isn't being told right now and as much as I felt that the movie like it wasn't perfect and it felt sort of forced to deep at times the best part of the entire movie in addition to Brendan Fraser's acting which was great was the portrayal of Charlie as extremely humanizing. Charlie felt like a real person whose life you could relate to. Horrible things happened to him and he ended up with an addiction. He was a normal person with a daughter and a job and who suffered through loss and enjoyed love and just all of these things that we actually, they're simple things, but we don't, we don't really see them being told about people in this position right now. That level of character depth is, is 100% not a story you are seeing about people who are 600 pounds right now. The only other depiction of people who are 600 pounds is on TLC. And TLC, as we know, it's all the worst angles and moments. And it, it's all done, obviously, to inspire as much gawking as physically possible. And I'm not trying to take some like moral high ground. I'm just saying that the purpose of these two two pieces is, is completely different. And I really think that this whole situation that we see in the whale, like why I think the story is so important, I think that this is a situation that is going to continue to be more prevalent. Here we have this normal and perfect person with the perfect storm of circumstances and self-loathing to find themselves in this extreme position of addiction. And I think that this problem in society, this story in society is realistically just gonna become more and more and more prevalent. Right now, the food environment is 
fucked up. Like there's literally no other way to put it. It is extremely fucked up right now. The food environment is actively hostile to human health. That is my opinion. For a simple example, I can only imagine right now how many people are addicted to food ordering apps. Food ordering apps from a behavior change perspective they change they change the game they're literally a death sentence for a portion of the population quick behavior change rundown of what makes a food ordering app so dangerous first rule of making a behavior more likely is ease we make the desired behavior as easy as possible it's frictionless pull out your phone instant access to whatever food you want like this is the first time in history this has ever been true and we are just getting started we have no idea how this is going to impact human health but i just i do not think it is going to be good friction has also been reduced by the fact that you don't even have to look at a cat year you don't have to look at a single person you can literally have your food ordered to your door and not even come outside which is actually a moment in the movie as well a moment that was probably the saddest for me in the entire movie is this exact moment where charlie is always ordering pizza from the same place and gets the same delivery driver all the time he always leaves the money outside you can tell that over time the delivery driver is getting curious as to why he's never seen charlie and why he refuses to come outside and one day of course the delivery driver like pretends to leave but waits around to see charlie come outside Saddest part in the whole movie for me, honestly, I hated that part. <laughs> they see each other, they lock eyes, and it's just like so fucking sad. It just makes you think like how many times that exact scenario has like probably like played out and it's just, it's just heartbreaking. That one was probably the closest I got to crying. Like it was just like, ouch, it gets you right in the real sad. But back to the behavior change thing, friction reduced again by the fact that you don't have to pay anybody. You don't even have to pull out your credit card. You don't have to go find it. You won't even feel the pain of that transaction hitting your wallet because it's already preloaded. I could literally go on and on and on about how behaviorally food ordering apps are a terrible thing for a certain subset of the population. I feel so lucky that in my peak obese years, I didn't develop a food ordering habit. Like that would be so difficult to break. And I think about all the young people who are going to develop that habit. It's not going to be good, especially because at that point in your life, when you're a little bit younger, you have more spending money. Like, um before you have any real responsibilities, like that's the time when that habit is gonna get real wedged into people's lives. Like if I wanted fast food, I had to walk like a while. And even if I did, I couldn't eat it in secret. So it sort of defeated the purpose. So I was really limited to ordering pizza, one of the only things that would be delivered. And then you kind of have to deal with the issue of ordering from the same place, which is awkward. If you order too many times, you're gonna have to deal with the discomfort of seeing the same delivery driver over and over and over again. And then that discomfort acts as a sort of friction, keeping that behavior from spiraling out of control. It's these little frictions that keep things like that in check. And without them, things get out of hand. One of the things that keeps that behavior from amplifying, and it's one of the things that we've now removed and this is just one tiny example of how genuinely hostile the current food environment actually is. This is why this video is a rant though, because I now have to rant further about the food industry. <laughs> Controversial statement, but dude, the food environment is the sole reason, sole reason, I stand by it, that the obesity epidemic is literally exploding right now. Something needs to be done about this food environment like yesterday. I already know making this comment, I'm going to get people who are like, that's bullshit. People are raging, saying it's only your fault if you're obese, whatever, whatever, whatever. And you know what? That is factually half true. Only half. The world is not black and white. The world is shades of gray. I cannot stand when I see people thinking and just like black and white. It's just like, come on. It's a cognitive distortion. Things are not that simple. Yes, obese people put the food in their mouths. No one's putting a gun to their head. They are factually active participants in their own self-destruction, just like Charlie, and they are the only ones who can change. Facts, right? Anyone who's saying it's 100% genetics and it can't be changed is factually incorrect. And in my opinion, looking for a way to justify their own lack of success with behavior change. We need personal responsibility to change and we have it within us to change. We are not helpless victims of the food environment and we're responsible for our choices as adult conscious human beings. However, at a population level, when you have an obesity rate that's literally spiraling out of control, that is not just an individual level problem. People aren't changing. People are basically the same as they were 50 years ago, but the food environment is rapidly changing. What we're eating right now is mostly wrong for our bodies. Look what happens when the Western way of eating moves to developing countries. They quickly get fat and sick. We know what the problem is, but nothing is being done to change it. And that is where, again, the individual has to step in and save themselves because no one else is going to do that for us. That's why personal responsibility and awareness are always going to be for the foreseeable future 
90% of the solution and the answer. We are the solution to the obesity epidemic and we have to save ourselves because big food is not changing in any miraculous way anytime soon. In fact, they're only getting worse. I'm really excited to show you guys some of the videos I have coming up because even I continue to be shocked by what I find. Just the level of corporate greed and power at this point in history, it is completely out of control and governments are just as just as guilty and just as bad when it comes to this. Like, dude, why is corporate lobbying legal? Like the entire food industry is like the juiciest novel you've ever read, except it's about real life and it's happening right now and affecting the health of millions of people worldwide. The state of the food industry really just is that deranged. When I talk to you guys about behavior change, obviously we're talking on this like individual personal level, but one of the biggest uses of behavior change is public health. Governments and corporations hire nudge teams, behavioral economists, behavioral scientists, psychologists, little groups of behavioral specialists to change our behavior for us at the population level. And they'll usually use the science to help make you recycle or vote or take a vaccine. And what they know and what their science says is that if you arrange the environment in a certain way, you will predictably get a certain result in a subset of the population always. Behavior change is more like a science than a lot of psychology is. It's designed to produce results. And the fact of the matter is we live in an environment that predictably creates ill health based on the behavior change formula. And we've known this for a very long time, but nothing ever changes. So the fact of the matter is we have to save ourselves. Even if you don't have a weight problem, just like don't eat their shitty food. <laughs> like that is my dream that we're all just like, no, I'm not falling for your shit. Anyway, food industry rant over. I actually had like four more pages of ranting about that, but I will, I'll, I'll save it for another video. <laughs> Fat acceptance and the controversy surrounding this movie rant begins. It really is hard to know even where to start with the criticisms of fat phobia surrounding this movie because they are just so out of touch with reality. That is really the best way that I can put it. To sum it up, fat acceptance types, as well as a lot of thin film critics, felt like the depiction of Charlie was grotesque. And then that was the point of the movie, to make you gawk at this disgusting man. But that was literally the opposite of what was going on. It was about the character beneath the man. Like that was the point of the whole movie. As a fat person, I found the whale a a devastating nearly two hours of intentional fat shaming. Not only do many people in the fat community, myself included, find the word obesity to be demeaning and cruel, more on that in a minute, but the way that Hunter and director Darren Aronofsky choose to portray Charlie is unequivocally a stereotypical character. If you watch this movie and you felt that that was nothing but two hours of fat shaming, you need to do some self-reflection immediately. That is an incredibly distorted perception of your own. That is not what happened in the movie. A stereotypical character, a stereotypical character, like the entire point of the movie is the depth of the man's character. The portrayal is the opposite of a stereotype. You spend like, I think it's like a week or something with the man in his apartment. Like all you get to see is his character. Like it's not like, there's, it's so far from a stereotype. It's just, the movie literally actively challenges assumption that people might have about people who are 600 pounds. It was painful to watch these stereotypes play out along with hearing every other character in the film beg Charlie to will his fatness away. Ironic that in a film about a literal queer man, characters beg him to not be fat. This movie is about a man at the brink of death due to his self-destructive eating behavior. And this person who wrote this thinks that the other characters are wrong for wanting Charlie to will his fatness away. You mean to not die from eating too much? I feel like we're doing people like the author of this paper a disservice by pretending what they're saying is a normal, rational reaction to this. Somehow, even after years of research, proving that all bodies are different and if every person ate and worked out the same, we would still have different sized bodies, the whale continues to perpetuate severely outdated and harmful arguments. This person is implying that what? The character could somehow be 600 pounds without eating a lot of food? That's a harmful and outdated argument. Not this one, but articles pretty much exactly like this were published in Salon Magazine, The New York Times, at the Atlantic, there is now a group of well-educated, relatively intelligent people who sincerely believe that there is a 600 pound set point. And it's really like, how exactly did we get to this point? So many other creative choices feel unnecessary. In one scene, Charlie, in a fit of emotional pain, gorges himself on any food he can find, starting with a greasy pizza. Before long, his face is slicked with grease and he has thrown open his refrigerator, desperate for anything to fill the yawning void of hurt from which he cannot escape. 
There is another scene in which he eats a bucket of fried chicken. I think a lot of people can relate to this moment. I don't find this outlandish at all. It doesn't have to be food either. It's a depiction of the cyclical, tragic, desperate nature of addiction and it's extremely realistic. It's like having a movie about a drug addict who you never see doing drugs. It's your own issue if you don't think that eating a lot of food is a part of being dangerously, morbidly obese, being 600 pounds. And then there is his wardrobe, tent-like clothing, threadbare, perpetually soaked in sweat, the rolls of his stomach spilling over his thighs, the walker he cannot move without, always by his side as he heaves himself up each time he needs to change locations. The way the whale is told reflects such a profound and pathetic dearth of imagination. At several points, my wife and I wanted to walk out of the screen and we didn't want to seem rude or oversensitive. It sort of feels like this person's perspective is the prejudiced one. Like, that's how I feel reading that. People suffering with major depression to this degree, do you think that they're like fashionistas? And then you throw being 600 pounds and having mobility issues into the mix? This is reality. And if the writer is disgusted by what they see, like, that's their own problem for whatever reason. I thought the movie did a great job of portraying the cold reality of the situation while emphasizing that he was a flawed man like anyone else with good parts and bad parts and awful parts and lovable parts. It would be the same if he was an extreme drug addict. They're not the most cleanly, stylish people either and they are the people in society that a lot of people will turn away from and prejudge just based on that information alone. And I do think that this movie probably made people think twice about the way they might judge someone in a situation like that. And I think it made people rethink who maybe hadn't thought about it before about what preconceptions they might have about a person like that that may be wrong. Which I think is really important because like I said, I think that the amount of people living at this weight, I think that this number of people in society, I think it's just going to keep growing unless something is done nearly immediately about the food environment. This is unfortunately a problem that's just going to keep getting worse if we don't do something drastic about the food environment in the immediate future. To sort of put into perspective just how misguided these critiques are, and you know what, just how misguided most fat acceptance critiques are in general, I think this next article really puts into perspective how distorted their perspective of this entire situation is and maybe where that distortion is coming from. The Whale is a horror film that tapped into our fear of fatness. The writer says that the movie is not a drama, it's not a redemption tale, it's a horror movie, specifically a body horror movie. Body horror is a subset of the horror film genre that depicts the destruction, degeneration, or mutation of the human body. These films are designed to gross out viewers and the protagonist often becomes the monster of the story as their body becomes more and more repulsive. I don't know anything about the genre, I don't know if this video fits in with that, but the whale, I did not feel like they went out of their way to make you look at his body at all. His body was a part of the film, but it wasn't about grossing you out with it. You only see his full body at a few key moments throughout the film. The writer then goes on to compare the whale to a bunch of movies within the body horror genre, specifically The Fly, Rabbit, and one called Tusk. I don't know why, but I picked Tusk and I watched it. <laughs> You know, if you've heard that movie, you probably hear me saying that and you're like, oh, fuck. <laughs> it's like the wackest movie I have ever seen in my entire life. To compare these two movies is like, it's absolutely deranged. I don't know how many images I can show from it. But these are not similar movies, okay? You're gonna have to, you have to take, take my word for it. <laughs> if you watch The Whale and you watch Tusk and you came away from these thinking that they were similar movies, that is a you problem. Your perspective is very, 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 very off. Anyways, I hope you guys like this long ass rant on this movie. This is the type of thing where I'm like, am I really gonna write my opinion on a movie? But I feel like I ended up turning it into something else anyway. So hope you guys enjoyed it and I will see you in the next one.